Christians from abroad to bless this country. It's one way of saying thank you to this great nation that took the gospel everywhere, paid for the translation of the Bible into so many languages. And it's our turn now to say thank you and bless this country. I think one of the battles for the church today is the place of the Word of God in the church. What place does the Word of God play in the life of the church today? I'm a fourth generation Anglican, and sadly, with the exception of a few uh, faithful churches, as a denomination, the Anglican Church has said no to the Word of God as the only reference, as the only source of authority. So I think it's right that we should concentrate on the Word of God this morning. You will see in my first, is there a picture? Oh yes, you have a picture. So in the first slide, I've included a picture of the Comoran Caves uh, near the Dead Sea, not far from where my mother comes from, and then a picture of the manuscripts uh, that were discovered there. The copies of the Old Testament, several copies obviously, different ages, uh, a, you know, stretching from the 3rd century before Christ to the 1st century after Christ. Why, why have I uh, um, shown these pictures? Just to remind you that the Bible you have is a very reliable Bible. Amen. It is trustworthy historically. Amen. My main ministry as a Middle Eastern man from Israel is to prepare evangelists and pastors to share the gospel with Muslims. That's my personal mission. Um, and I'm often confronted with this claim, your Bible has been changed. And yet Muslims have no evidence that the Bible has been changed. The Quran doesn't say the Bible has been changed, but that is what they have been taught, to repeat and reiterate the Bible has been changed. Well, how do we know it hasn't? There's one piece of evidence. Those manuscripts are no different from the Old Testament that Jesus read and what we read now. There are minor differences which make no difference to the message. Um, besides the New Testament itself, we have 25,000 manuscripts, at least seven or 8,000 in Greek, and, and there's uh, Persian and Aramaic, etc. etc. And the more manuscripts you have, the more chance for variations. And yet there are very few variations, none of them are essential. So the Word of God you have between your hands is reliable. Of course what you have is a translation or different translations. But if you're really committed enough, you can go and learn Greek and Hebrew and see for yourself. Having been brought up in Israel, I had no choice but to learn Hebrew. So I can read the Old Testament in Hebrew. And that's a blessing for me as a Christian. I didn't see it that way as a school kid. I hated it. <laughs> um, all right, so let's launch into this. Psalm 119 and Psalm 19 are the best chapters in the Bible about the Bible itself. Um, so I've chosen the subject because the Bible is a battle place. We are under pressure to compromise the Word of God. Going back to the word of Islam, have you heard of Chrislam? Chrislam? It's a new version of Christianity that makes it easy for Muslims to become Christian without having to suffer. So they can still say the Shahada and say that Allah is in Allah, not God, is the only true God, and Muhammad is a messenger. Um, so it's a compromised religion. Here is a man who knew what it's like to be pressurized to compromise. Martin Luther, the German uh, reformer. Vera is half German, my daughter. And um, he was one of the gifts of God to the church, Martin Luther, not the only reformer. But he was, um, his message was, if the Bible doesn't say it, I won't do it. If the Bible says it, I will do it. The Bible only was his message. And many of his friends, certainly his enemies, were saying, why don't you compromise? This is his response. He says, the world at the present time is sagaciously discussing how to well controversy and strife over doctrine and faith, and how to effect a compromise between the church and the papacy. And he says, let the learned, the wise, it is said, 
bishops, emperors and princes, arbitrate it. You don't have to be obstinate and say the Bible only. Let these people arbitrate, let them negotiate. Each side can easily yield something, compromise with something. And it is better to concede some things which can be constructed according to individual interpretation. Have you heard this? Interpretation? I think one of the biggest enemies of the scriptures nowadays is interpretation. We want to interpret everything when it's obviously clear what the Bible means. Hmm. So according to individual interpretation, then that so much persecution, bloodshed, war, terrible and endless dissensions and destructions be permitted. And you still hear it today, the reformers caused division. The reformers didn't cause division. It's the arrogance of those who will not submit to the word of God. They're the ones who caused uh, division. And here's Martin Luther's response. Here is lack of understanding. Those who say compromise don't really understand. For understanding proves by the word that such patchwork is not according to God's will. You can't mix God's word with man's word. That patchwork doesn't work. But that doctrine, faith and worship must be preserved pure and uh, unadulterated. There must be no mingling with human nonsense, human opinions or wisdom. Whoops. The scriptures give us this rule. We must obey God rather than men. That's in Acts 5.29. So, if we turn to the, um, the psalm, Psalm 119, uh, when you read buzzwords or keywords jump out of the page uh, uh, before you, and for me the words that sort of jump out of the page are the law of God, the human heart, obedience, happiness, blessedness, they're the words that sort of jump out. And um, we need to look at these words as dots that need connecting. So that's what I'll be doing in the next few minutes, connecting these dots. You will notice that the psalm contains questions. And so I've turned the first 16 verses into questions and answers. So the first question is, how do you become blessed or happy? Uh, in the Hebrew it's esher, esher is happiness. And the answer is, be blameless. If you want to be happy, be blameless, be without sin. And that is what Jesus recommended, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. Do you want to be happy? Try and live without sin. Try and be perfect like your heavenly Father. We also read in Peter, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your, uh, all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The word in Hebrew for holy is kadosh, and that is where we get the Arabic uh, word for Jerusalem, al-Quds, you will have heard it, uh, the house of the holy place, al-Quds, Kodesh. And what it means, it means if something is holy, it means it's been taken out of a group out of a category and set aside for one purpose and one purpose only. Okay? That's the meaning of holy. If you are to be holy, it means you have to leave everything behind and be set aside. Your mind, your body, your wealth set aside for God. As we were singing today, we were singing some songs we were saying, uh, I surrender all. That's holiness. Everything set aside only for God. Your mind, your body, your wealth, everything set aside for God. And from this attitude of complete commitment throughout all the acts of righteousness. So how can you be happy? Try and be holy, try and be without sin. How can you be without sin? Be totally committed, set aside uh, for God. Surrender all. Question two. How can we be blameless? Okay, we're still on the, we start with answering. It says, keep his statutes. Keep his statutes. If you keep God's laws, you will be blameless. And the Hebrew for keep is 
shmor, guard, like somebody who's paid a salary to sit and guard a building, keep it from being corrupted and stolen and damaged. Okay? So it's not just keep in the sense of do or enact God's laws, but as a church we have a duty to preserve God's word that is always being under attack. Always being attacked. We have a guardianship towards uh, the word of God. And then he says, obey them fully. Okay? Fully. Not selectively. In this day and age, we have what, we, what some people have called uh, cafeteria Christianity. You go past the cafeteria and say, no, don't like this. Oh, I love that. I have two or three of these. I hate this. You can't do this with the Bible. You have to obey it fully. We were given the whole counsel of God, not selectively. You can be sure Peter, Paul, and all the apostles didn't like everything Jesus taught them, but they faithfully passed on to us. We have a duty to fully obey because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We can't say to what God has inspired, ah, not for me, it's not good. It's too old fashioned. It doesn't fit in the 21st century. Can we do that? No. We can't. Sadly, people do, but we shouldn't. All scriptures, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The other word I want to draw your attention to is the word you have commanded. God has commanded. There's a tendency today to think of God as a big daddy, a big friendly, cuddly bear. <laughs> he is that, but he's more than that. God is to be obeyed because he commands. And who commands? A king. God is king. He is the king of kings. He is our master. So we have to have a balance. Don't get too familiar with God. There's an English saying that familiarity breeds contempt. That's what's happening in the church. God is just a big cuddly bear. You don't have to listen to everything he says. Those things don't apply today. I mean, how can you say these things about women? It's the 21st century. Sexuality, the biblical paradigm doesn't fit the 21st century. That's not how true Christians think. All God's commandments have to be obeyed, not selectively. And then verse 2, we say, and seek, seek him with all the heart. So how can you be blameless? Seek, don't just make a request, seek. Seeking is an active, it's an energy intensive activity. When you seek it means you look here, there, above, below, next to, you search. Okay? Searching is very intensive. Do you just scan through God's Word or do you search through the Scriptures? Do you seek? Seek has an, a, a, a hint of purposefulness. You know what you want to find. You have an expectancy. So you read the Bible with a sense of purpose and expectancy. That is seeking. Um, and the Lord Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find. The psalmist, again in Psalm 119, said, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Amen. So when we read the Word of God, we should pray, Lord, open our eyes. We have scales like Paul sometimes. Lord, just remove those scales. Scales of flesh, scales of selfishness, uh, opinionation, arrogance, disobedience. Rebellion, remove those scales, Father, so I can see wonders from your word. I seek you with all my heart. Again, if you want to be blameless, read the word of God and seek his understanding with all your heart. Don't seek half-heartedly. Don't, oh, all right then, that's not wholehearted. That means I've got nothing better to do. Seek God with all your heart. It means your heart is not divided. You don't have two opinions in your head. You don't have two or three desires or loves in your heart. Just one heart totally given to God. For, um, the psalmist also says, Give me an undivided heart that, that I may fear your name. 
we need to approach God, God's word with an undivided mind and heart. Um, question number three, how do you know that you are keeping his statutes? How do you know uh, that you're actually keeping God's word? Verse three says, follow his ways. Those who follow his ways do no wrong. So how do you know that you are following? Because you're not doing wrong. Uh, the Word of God says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Okay, how do you know you are keeping his statutes? What company do you keep? Do you know from that? Do you keep the right company? Do you mix with people who love God? Or do you only mix with the mockers? What company do you keep? And then, uh, uh, we continue with Psalm 19, uh, sorry, Psalm 1. And, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord? So what narrative do you like? What sort of stuff do you like to read or listen to? We're still answering the question of how do you know that you are keeping his statutes? We continue with Psalm 1. And who meditates on his law day and night. Do you meditate on the word Lord? Or on, on the Lord's word? Another, uh, put it another way, what is your preoccupation? Are you preoccupied with the things of God? Are you preoccupied with his word? What are you preoccupied with during the day? Your work, money, your ambitions? What proportion of your preoccupation does the Bible uh, have? That person is like a tree planted by springs of water, which yields its fruit in season. Yeah. Lastly, how do you know that you are keeping the statutes of the Lord? Because you're bearing fruit. Fruit of love, patience, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, are you winning souls with Jesus? Are you sharing the gospel with people? That's the fruit. Do people look at you and see Jesus in you? Paul said you are our epistles read by all men. The world is watching us. The world is watching us. You know, the world pressurizes the church to compromise and then disrespects the church for compromising. Mm. A lot of bullies like this, they like to test you. And if you stand up to them, they really respect you. So don't ever feel tempted to compromise, because all you will do is insult yourself. You will go down in the estimation of people for whom you are compromising. It doesn't pay to compromise. Be faithful to God's word, bear fruit. So, question number Four, and I will answer it in three parts. Um, verse 9, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? That is what the uh, psalmist asked, by living according to your word. So the key word here is stay. It's all very well to say, okay, I believe in the Bible. I'm, I'm doing today what the Bible says I should do. How about Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Do we stay? On the path of purity. We're talking about continuity. The Bible deserves to be continuously obeyed, not just occasionally. A Christian needs to have stamina, continuity, constancy, like love. Who wants to be loved once a week? You want to be loved all the time. God is eternal. He deserves eternal obedience. King Saul we often make a good start and we fizzle out. King Saul made a good start with God, but his end was very sad because he did not stay on the path of purity. He disobeyed God's word. Whereas Saul of Tarsus started off course, he was disobedient to the word of God, but in his latter life he came on course and stayed the course till his death. Okay? You see a picture here. That picture is of Jan Hus, the Czech reformer who preceded 
Martin Luther by at least a hundred years. You can visit Prague today and visit the, chap the Bethlehem Chapel where he taught. He died for his faith because he insisted on the Word of God only. No tradition. The sayings of Pope don't matter, particularly when they contradict the Bible. And he stayed the course till the end, and as he was being consumed by the flames, he cried, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. Brothers and sisters, we are today being challenged to stay the course to continually walk in the path of righteousness, to continuously obey the Word of God. The letters, the seven letters of Jesus to the seven churches in Asia Minor were written to churches that were being pressurized to compromise. Every one who lived in the Greco-Roman society had to compromise. If you go to Ephesus today, which is still, you know, visible to a point, you can walk under an arch, where Christians had to sacrifice, they had to burn incense to the emperor. Otherwise they couldn't go to the marketplace. They couldn't buy, sell, converse, and they were excluded because they would not sacrifice to another god. Paul, uh, uh, Jesus wrote to these people, and he said to the Ephesian Christians, he said, repent and do the things you did at first. God's word has to be obeyed, not just at the beginning only, all the way to the end. We have to do the same things that we did at first. We have to go back to our first love, that ardent love that says, I can't be without my beloved. I can't be without Jesus. Is Jesus and his word the focus of my heart? That is the question. What am I willing to give up for Jesus? Jan Hus knew what he was willing to do. We're almost there. Talk about stamina. Then what attitude should I have towards the Bible? If I want to be blessed, if I want to be happy. And the answer is, oh, that my ways were ready in obeying your decrees. The key word here is readiness. Are we ready to share the gospel with people? Are we ready to defend the Christian faith? Do you know the Bible enough to defend it, to explain it, to share it? When a Muslim says to you, your Bible has been changed, how do you answer? If the Bible, if, if, uh, if uh, an atheist say, prove to me that God exists, how do you answer? Um, and, and Paul says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. Now, preparation takes time, it takes commitment, it takes training. You can't be prepared by reading a, a, a chapter of a, a Bible at random every morning or evening. That, believe me, that won't be enough. You need to study the Bible. The Bible is understandable by all people. It's not too difficult to understand, but it requires frequency. You need to be committed to it. You need to train. You need to uh, give it time. You need to endure. Endurance, not endurance. And you have to have a learning attitude. You have to be able to sit at the feet of the Lord and learn from Him about His Word. Um, it looks like I'm determined to get my money's worth out of you guys, so I'll keep you waiting till I, the slide begins. I don't know why it's not working. So slide, have you got slide eight? No? Okay. So how do we go up? Thank you, Vera. I think I'm there. Uh, here we are. And uh, if you want to remember anything that I've shared with you, remember this. How much do you value God's word? How much? That's the question. I have hidden, the psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word in Hebrew for hidden is 
the same word as to treasure. Art tifanti in Arabic, it's tifanti, it's the same in Arabic. It's something you bury, like a treasure. And the question is this, how do you treat God's word? What, what is it worth to you? How much value do you place on God's word? Okay, so a, a treasure is something that is of great value, uh, one guards it very carefully. Uh, it's something you pass from one generation to the next. Are you passing God's word to the next generation? It is worth sacrificing for the story of that man who found a great treasure and went sold everything that we had in order to buy the field in which there was a treasure. It's worth sacrificing everything for the word of God. It's something you meditate upon. You. We all have our treasures, they may not be very expensive, but how often do you pull your treasure out and just look at it, admire it? I know my wife looks at her jewellery, just looks at it, comments on its brightness and its colour and so on. And do we do that to the Bible? Do we often treasure it, treat it as if it is so the most valuable things in our lives? But back to Martin Luther, he once said, in Suga, in, in summary, Next to the Word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. Okay, it's a roundabout way of saying that the Bible is the greatest treasure. Forget the music bit now. <laughs> that is what the Reformers thought. When they came across the Bible, which were denied, when they discovered it, they discovered a treasure. And uh, Jan Hus, the guy I shared with you earlier, who died for his Stance on the Bible said, Scripture is the highest species of revealed truth. Highest species of revealed truth. You can't get anything of greater value uh, than the Scriptures. In summary, happiness is knowing, meditating on, keeping, and treasuring God's Word. That's how you get happy. Psalm 19 uh, 10 says, They, that is the decrees of the Lord, are more precious than gold, and we sang that this morning, than much pure gold, that's the treasure. By them your servant is one, warned, so if you treasure the word of God, you can actually, you have no surprises in your life, you know what to expect, you know what dangers to avoid, you are prepared for every situation because the Bible has warned you. Many people say when they read the Bible, or listen to it. I've heard the testimony of many Muslim background believers who say they were listening to the preacher sharing the Bible and thinking, this man knows so much about me. How come? Because the Bible knows the heart of men and women and it warns you. It also keeps you, gives you a great reward. The reward of life eternal, um, which is far more valuable than what this world offers. Finally, in, in closing, Jan Hus, uh, uh, I've referred to him many times, uh, uh, a Czech reformer, he once said, seek the truth, that is God's word, then hear the truth, then learn the truth. We need to be learners, hearers, learners, love the truth, the heart, that's the treasure. Speak the truth, we have a duty to share God's word. Hold the truth and defend the truth until death, which he, exactly what he did with his life. And may God give us the courage to love his word unto death. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, brother. is our treasure. Amen? And it's been a blessing to hear and learn. Thank you. We'll have our last song to close the service. So we can stand and stretch ourselves to sing our last song. We believe.